Teach me about the Great Lakes. Teach me about the Great Lakes. Welcome back to Teach Me About the Great Lakes, a twice monthly podcast in which I, a Great Lakes novice, ask people who are smarter and harder working than I am to teach me all about the Great Lakes. My name is Stuart Carlton. I work with Illinois Indiana Sea Grant, and I'm actually rolling solo today. It is a busy time with deadlines, and so I am all by myself. And then a number of the staff just took off, but there's grant proposals due. There are papers due. It's the middle of the semester. But you know what? The podcast must go on. And so here I am for you, listeners. That's right, you. Well, not you, but you. Just doing it all by myself. And I'm really excited, actually, about what we have today for this show because our guest. Oh, oh I'm sorry, I forgot to. You know what? Let me just take this. Quinn, if you could edit this out. All right, just leave this out, Quinn. This part won't be in the. Yeah, all right. Okay. Uh, hello, this is Stuart. Stuart, where on earth are you? Oh, Ethan, I'm here. We've got proposals to. Where are you? You know, it's a handy time to go on vacation. I'm waiting on the boat. We're all waiting on you. On me? Yeah, we've got our three-hour tour. A three-hour tour? Yes, a three-hour tour. I guess I have time for a three-hour tour. All right, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to hop in the car, and um, and I'll be right there. And so can you all just wait? Uh, Lake Michigan, West Lafayette, with the speed I drive, it'll be four hours max, and I'll be there. Does that sound good? Yeah, I guess we'll sit around and play cards or something. All right, that's worth it. Okay, great. All right, see you. Okay, listener, why didn't know? Well, you know what? Let's just do this for the solo thing. It's fun sometimes to just, when you meet up people, sort of uh, record together and see what happens. So what I'll do is um, I got to get ready. So I'll play some transitional music or whatever. Then I'll hop into my car and, and uh, uh, we'll, we'll drive on over. Um, so, uh, yeah, we'll see you in a minute. Here I am driving. I've been driving for about three and a half hours now. I'm almost uh, almost all the way up to the lake shore. And oh, I don't know what that was. Um, and uh, anyway, so I'm excited to go visit with my friends and, and do a little bit of sailing. Let me see here. Pulling up there. Good. Let me hop on out if that makes sense. All right. All right, that's good. Hey, look at that. It's Carolyn. How are you, Carolyn? I'm doing great. I mean, check out the water today. It's looking pretty good. Glad you could make it. You know what, Carolyn, you're right. And I'm glad to have taken the minutes here. If you remember all the way back to Teach Me About the Great Lakes, Episode 9, we spoke with Dr. Ming Kuo uh, over at the University of Illinois. And she talked about the importance of getting outside and getting back to nature, uh, especially this was during COVID, the most stressful time um, or among the most stressful times. And um, and that's certainly true. But even now with all these proposals doing everything. But here's the problem is I don't actually know how to sail. Does anybody here know how to sail? Well, we've got Geneva here from Michigan Sea Grant. Geneva Lang England, Michigan Sea Grant. I didn't see you there. How are you? I'm doing great. I'm, I'm excited to pull some ropes and some sails under the sun today. Yeah, let's just uh, let's just do it. Oh, uh, you know, I guess we need. Uh, yeah, there's a little breeze out there, isn't there? Yeah, we might need to we might need to blow into the sails a little bit to get under steam, but we'll we'll get there eventually. Okay. Uh, great. Well, do you want me to do something with the mizzen mast or or, or what? Hoist it. Okay, let's <laughs> hoist away. Oh, let's hoist away. All right. Yeah, look at that. Now we're going. Uh, it's good to be out on the water. Look at that. Hey, you can see the Chicago skyline. Boy, that looks nice, doesn't it? Hey, is that Chewy over there? Oh, it sure is. Hey, Chewy, how's it going? Chewy's going to be coming out of the water soon, probably, but we did talk with Chewy uh, earlier this year, too, didn't we? We sure did. We sure did. And learned about all the valuable data uh, that, that it's collected. So that's fantastic news. Well, this is really good. Hey, Geneva, do you think do you think I could maybe take the, uh, I could take the sails for a little bit? I guess so, Stuart, but make sure you don't steer us back into shore just yet. We're only in the beginning of our three-hour tour. Oh, yeah, don't worry. I'll get the full three hours out of this, baby. All right, this is good. So this is the tiller. Boy, that's looking really good. Yeah, it seems totally. like a dangerous idea, guys. Well, I don't know about that. The no, wind we is can so trust calm. him. It's been Neva trust him. I'm an administrator. Just relax. 
I can white guy with a degree, man. It's all fine. Don't even That's worry That's why about I'm it. afraid. Oh. Yeah. As long as we don't capsize, we're fine. Yeah. Boy, that wind sure seems to be kind of picking up a bit, doesn't it? It's getting yeah. just a little bit stronger. Oh, my. I'm not sure the sails can handle this. I don't know either. They're looking not good. Uh-oh. This is not looking good at all. Oh. Oh, God. Look out. Oh, no. Not good at all. Sorry about this one, guys. Ah, uh, oh, what would you do? Oh, oh, I saw Chewie and I. Oh. It's not supposed to do that, is it? No. What happened to the tiller? Is that the sail floating away over that way? Goodbye, mizzen mast. <laughs> oh no, there goes my toolbox. Well, the water isn't coming in that quickly. Ethan, do you have your phone? Maybe you could call Sito while I bail some of this water. Yeah, I can try. The service out here isn't great. All right. Well, while you call them, I guess... uh... Oh, look, here's a, a newspaper. I guess we can just read the newspaper while we wait. Well, you know what? Since we're reading the newspaper, we might as well sing our, our favorite song, um, the, uh, the Great Lakes News, I suppose. <laughs> Thank you for that, Stuart. Look at this. Yeah, we happen to have this of Great Lakes booze. Huh. So it's so it's not the regular Great Lakes news. No, mm-hmm. no, Great Lakes booze. I don't know what that means. B O O S, not B O O Z E. Great Lakes booze. I had it just fell overboard. <sighs> well, who who'd like to read a story? Might as well take some turns. Yeah, I I actually see a, a story there on the second page that I think I remember reading something about. Let let's see if I can remember all the details. Yeah. So so the headline the headline here in the paper is. Girl vanishes under shellish circumstances. So so here's what I think I remember. There was this, this girl, she was, I don't know, 10, 11 years old, walking along the beach of Lake Michigan somewhere in Michigan, I'm pretty sure. And she was barefoot, as you usually are on the beach, and she stepped on something in the sand that cut her foot. And she, she turned around and she saw sticking out of the sand a zebra mussel shell. Now, if you guys, I'm pretty sure you guys know about zebra mussels, but they're these these little invasive species that live all over the Great Lakes. They're they're kind of like a tiny clam, about the size of your thumbnail, and their shells are all striped, black and white, like zebras, or their bigger cousins, the quagga mussels. And so, so this girl had the experience that lots of us have, where we cut our feet on a mussel shell. She's like, eh, this happens all the time on the beach, no problem. So she just kept walking, and when she, you know, got home after her day on the beach, she put a band-aid on her foot, and it was fine. But the next morning when she woke up, she looked at her foot, and her foot was kind of striped. And she was like, that's a really weird sandal tan. I don't think my sandal straps made that pattern on my foot, but... I guess that's what it must be. So she ignored it. And then the next day she woke up and her leg was striped. And she pointed it out to her parents and they said, ah, don't worry about it, honey. We'll just keep an eye on it. And the next morning she woke up and her other leg was also striped. So they went to the doctor and the doctor just shrugged and said it should go away in a few days. But every day that this girl woke up, she found her tummy was striped and then her neck was striped and her arms and then one day she woke up and her face was covered in these black and white stripes and she was starting to get kind of freaked out but what can you do it's just you know color on your skin she was trying not to let it freak her out too much but she went to bed that night and in the next morning she didn't get out of bed the time she usually did and so her parents went in to wake her up And when they pulled back the covers on her bed, there was nothing left but a pile of dried-out, crusty zebra mussel shells. 
Oh, no. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> spooky like, time. Extremely spooky. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. I mean, we talk about them, you know, being aliens and stuff, but this takes it to a whole new level. It really does. <laughs> Might explain why they're so successful, too. Oh, yeah. yeah. Did you hear that? I don't, I don't know. Okay. Whatever it was, maybe it was just a, a seagull. Yeah, it must have been a seagull. One of the many types of seagulls that we have uh, in, in Great Lakes, especially in, in Extension. Huh. Well, that's an interesting story. Hey, Ethan, have you heard from Sito yet? Um, I, I really... They said it's going to be quite a while. They are very busy today. There's a lot of issues. Uh, um, so we, we might be here for a bit. All right. I can keep bailing here. Um, why don't you read a story? I'll help okay. you bail, well, Stuart. Okay, be... Wait. I don't know. All right, go ahead, Ethan. This situation with the boat kind of reminds me a little bit of a, something my grandfather told me a long time ago. And this was what he experienced after uh, he lost his his lake house into uh, Lake Michigan. The waters came. Propelled by wind and one another, they came. Again and again they came. Violently driven by some unseen force, they came. What existed before them did not matter. They came. Age, race, wealth matter not. They came. Onward, always onward, they came. Untouchable spaces inundated. Unbreakable objects shattered. Again and again they came. Newly transient and discarded objects lifted aloft like trophies and kept to display. And pressing once more they came. Heroes emerged. Scoundrels, cowards, and fools were exposed. Yet onward, onward, onward they came. Thrust upon the land with an inexplicable animus for life, they came. Blotting out the sky. Dampening the light, they came. Disregarding barriers, man-made or natural, they came. Forward, forward, they pulsed, climbing atop one another. Wave after wave, they came. Scratching the daylight into night, hungering to grow, they came. Lives clinging to boats, walls, window frames, ropes, and one another, they came, shredding lanyards, limbs, lives, and livelihoods. They came. Onward they drove, marching unthinkingly to the commands of an unseen master. They came, piling their body over body over the bulwarks, swallowing sands, flora, fauna, and earth indiscriminately. They came. And as they crest on the instant of their victory, that moment of greatest dread and desolation, they stopped. They slacked. Their hidden driver mysteriously slain, retreating, pulling back, dragging their fallen behind them, they stop. Their hatred doused. Their unquenchable thirst slaked, they stopped. Slinking back where they came from, abandoning their assault, they stopped. The lands bearing the scars, torn asunder and thrashed. Grateful people coming out, clinging to one another, reminded of a fragility they tend to forget. They breathe he heavily, gasping at what was lost. But then, just as the sun arrives and Peace begins to start. A second force arrives, driven by sweet words. Easy supplies and black hearts, they came. A horde of demons just as relentless, just as ruthless, they came. With their axes and picks and concrete and cash, they came. Pressing, crushing, Eating a little bit more each incursion, they came, devouring the wounded, lapping at the survivors, tendrils spreading, 
more productive, more developed, better than before. They came, descending like carrion, just as relentless, just as hungry, gnashing just as malevolently. They came. I'm going to be honest, Ethan. <laughs> that is not making me feel good as we're bailing no, out this not. boat that's being full of water. My goodness. Gran- Grandpa was a bit of a dark man. <laughs> yeah. oh. so was that, was that was gentrification the demon here? It almost sounded metaphorical. He, he was not a fan of people that would buy out people who lose their homes. <laughs> oh, jeez. What is that, Stuart? I, I don't That's know. Weird. I have no idea. All right, well, no suit right. yet. I'm going to flip to the paper. Let's see. Okay, hand me the bucket, and I'll go back to bailing. Yeah, here's the bucket. All right, let, let's see. Sports, uh, news. Oh, this is interesting. The luckiest day of his life. All right, I'll read this one. Rocky Powell had a hard luck life. Rough upbringing, abusive father, the whole deal. Don't even get me started on his aunt. Unusual writing style for a newspaper art. Anyway, all right. But Rocky knew that he was destined for great things because he, rare among his peers, had an entrepreneurial spirit. He also had a cynicism for the system and recognized that people who got ahead were not those who worked hardest, but those who knew how to take advantage of those who worked hardest. Leverage, baby, that's right. He knew that one day he would use his drive, his cleverness, and his skill to get ahead. Rocky was kicked out of middle school for secretly switching kids' candy cigarettes out for real ones, selling the candy cigarettes to teachers who needed a sugar boost, and then using those proceeds to buy more real cigarettes. It wasn't super profitable, but he made it up in volume. Plus, he stole the real cigarettes from the convenience store, which helped his margins considerably. High school wasn't long lasting for Rocky either. He was just one of those guys that didn't fit in with normal life. He fought with the football players. He fought with the wrestling team. He was about to fight the debate club, but they talked him out of it. Rocky kept working his way through because he knew something that these cretins didn't. That the system was rigged and success would come to those who could manipulate the rigging like so many sailboats on Lake Michigan. Somehow or other, rumor has it it had something to do with a different kind of cigarettes. Rocky got dirt on Bridget Kane, the high school data entry clerk. Together, they began to fix grades for money. He'd add points to your exam for two bucks each, points to your final grade for four bucks each. Rocky kept half, gave half of what was left to Bridget, and then spent the other half on the track. One day, Bridget found out that Rocky was keeping half of her half, and she was not happy. Rocky left town minutes ahead of the police catching up with him. He headed north to Chicago, Chi-Town, the second city, the Windy City, with few dollars and fewer prospects. From there, Rocky's life started to spiral. He couldn't keep steady work. He was too small time for petty work. And he had to scrounge for everything that he could get. Down on his luck and down to his last dollar, Rocky took a trip to the beach to clear his mind. As he was walking down the beach, he saw a man waiting in Lake Michigan, grabbing for something in the water, picking it up and putting it in his mouth. What the... he said. He edged closer. The man had long wild hair filled with lake detritus, more seaweed than hair at this point, and his pupils were spirals, pulsating rapidly to a polyrhythmic beat. He was plucking gobies from the lake bed, one at a time, and snarfing them down like popcorn. An occasional goby ended up in his wild hair, where it would disappear with a crunching noise. Uh, The wild-haired man stared right at Rocky, his spiral eyes looking deep into Rocky's soul. Rocky felt a shiver, but he couldn't look away. You need help, the man said. Take this. He reached and gave him a small rock the size of a large pebble. It was nearly perfectly smooth, had a small smudge of dirt on it. As he grasped the stone, Rocky felt a surge of energy, and he knew that this would be his lucky day. He splashed some water on the stone to clear the dirt, and he saw a pattern emerge, a series of hexagonal white shapes against the mottled gray of the stone. Ah, this this must be a Petoskey, Petoskey stone, Rocky thought. I've heard of these. He thumbed the limestone and looked at the pattern, white stripes of fossilized coral. He remember reading about, way back in middle school, he used to read about this, I assume, uh, about how they were formed by glaciation when ice sheets ripped stones off the bedrock, distributing them all around Michigan. He'd never seen one before. But the spiral pattern on this one matched the man's eyes, which didn't seem quite normal. In addition, the stone was unnaturally warm to the touch. As Rocky turned to leave, the man called out, One thing, he said, the stone will help you, but the help is not free. One day your time will come. 
Thank you, said Rocky. And he walked away, feeling a sense of optimism for the first time in months. I have a feeling that this is going to be the luckiest day in my life. Rocky made a pendant out of the stone, hung it around his neck, and went to look for work. He quickly found a job that, while not exactly legal, was certainly lucrative, running numbers for the local organized crime ring. Now, Rocky had never run numbers before, and he wasn't sure how it worked, but David Tight Lips Bullet was happy to teach him the basics. It was actually surprisingly straightforward. You would go to the warehouse where some numbers were kept. You would pick up a number from the pile, and then you'd run it to another warehouse, put it on a conveyor belt, and watch it disappear. The faster, the better. The higher, the better. You take a number, you run it, you profit. Running numbers. Turns out, Rocky was really good at running numbers. First, he ran a 6. Then he ran a 9. After that, he ran a 17. Within a few weeks, he was running higher and higher numbers, making more and more money as he went. He was, in fact, the first rookie to ever successfully run a 26. Wasn't easy, but it soon became second nature to him. Each time he thought it would be too hard, the numbers were too high, he was running too fast, he would feel the Petoskey stone around his neck pulsating with energy. Rocky would harness that energy for the bursts of strength he needed and complete the run. Run it good indeed. Sometimes he'd even run it a second time just to show off. Soon, Rocky started inventing new ways to run numbers. He ran a three in one hand, a seven in the other, totaling ten. After he built up his strength further, he could run double digits in each hand, totals that were previously unheard of. 37, 59, 72! The money came so fast and easy that Rocky didn't bother to ask what the numbers were for. He bought packs upon packs of candy cigarettes, the good time kind that still said cigarettes on them, not candy sticks. He bought cars, diamonds, tax breaks, you name it. Life, in short, was good. One day, Rocky was at a bar taking a breather in the middle of an easy 16 run. He saw Tight Lips Bullet over in the corner, huddled over a table next to Vicky Savage. Rocky hadn't met Savage before, but he knew that she was high, really high up in the organization. They were nibbling on candy cigarettes themselves and whispering to each other. As Rocky approached them to say hello, he noticed Bullet's laptop was open to a spreadsheet. Columns titled, Life Seconds Harvested, Conversion Rate, Total Energy. What the? said Rocky. He ducked his head to avoid being seen and eavesdropped on their conversation. Well, boss, if we can harvest another 12 million life seconds from our runners, we'll have enough to convert it to a year's worth of power for the entire city. Bullet whispered. From there, profits will be up 14%. Quite a satisfactory YOY gain. Well, do we have enough runners with enough life left to harvest that many? Asked Savage. As he did this, Rocky felt a Petoskey stone heating up against his chest. We should, said Bullet. The new guy, Powell, he's already harvested 62 million seconds. That's two years off his life. He should be good for at least another uh, 38 million seconds before he starts to feel the effects. Rocky started sweating as he heard this the Petoskey stone burning against his chest. He tried to slink out of his chair, but as he got up, the stone reached white-hot temperatures and he let out a yelp. Savage and Bullet looked over, candy cigarettes dangling out of the corner of their mouths. Powell! Bullet called. Get him! yelled out Savage, and Rocky ran like he was carrying the biggest number of his life. Out of the bar, down the street, and away as fast as he could. Bullet ran after him, fast enough that Rocky couldn't shake him, but far enough that Rocky could keep going. Finally, Rocky had an idea. The lake! The lake! He ran to the lake and dove in. What he didn't see was the textbook transverse bar morphology with long ridges cutting across the lake from shore. He ignored the pier over to the other side. As he swam out, the lake water sloshed around like a bath. By the time Rocky realized that this was the classic setup for a rip current, it was too late. The water was pulling him out and under. The last thing Rocky felt as he was sucked below the surface was the pulsating warmth of the Petoskey stone the spiral coral shapes glowing eerily in the afternoon light. Rocky woke up on the deck of a boat, his arms and legs bound. That's not how you're going to go, Powell, said Vicky Savage, driving the boat while Type's lips bullet held him down. You're going to go like this. Rocky felt the knife go in and the blood stream out. Tight lips started to push Rocky overboard. As he did, Rocky was able to grab his leg and pull them both over. The current started to pull them away from the boat. Savage seemed uninterested in following I can't have you pulling me in, too, she said, driving off toward the setting sun. You fool, said Bullet. Now it will lead us both. What will? asked Rocky. The bull shark, cried Bullet. But but they don't have bull sharks in Lake Michigan, shouted Rocky. I know, said Bullet. That's why we had to import this one from the Gulf. Rocky saw a single fin knifing through the water. Minutes later, there was nothing but a sea of red and a Petoskey stone pendant glowing brightly as it floated in the current. Oh, now it's got like one of those little paragraph breaks. You don't usually see those. You know, like a little line? That's unusual in a newspaper story. Hmm. 
Alan Broussard beamed at the trophy, sitting in the front of his truck with pride. He had never won a fishing tournament before, and to do so under such unusual circumstances was secretly pleasing. This was an all-fish total weight tournament. Everyone entered five fish that they caught, and the highest total weight won. To win it the way that he had was a little bit surprising, too. No one had ever actually seen a bull shark in Lake Michigan, but it was theoretically possible, <laughs> since they can tolerate fresh water. Somehow, Bruce Hart had managed to catch one, though. The tournament judges were agog, especially since this one was apparently unusually heavy for its size. Must have had a big meal recently, said the judges. Scientists had wanted to study the bull shark to figure out where to come from, but Alan was from southwest Louisiana. Bull shark is a food fish there, and Alan had a family to feed. So he took his trophy, took his prize money, and took his catch and headed home. Bull shark creole for everyone tonight, he thought. Alan patted the Petoskey stone pendant that he had found floating in the lake earlier that day. It was strangely warm, and Alan was feeling more optimistic than ever. I have a feeling, he thought to himself, that this is going to be the luckiest day in my life. Oh, my, that's also not making me feel awesome, given our particular situation. <laughs> yeah, well, you don't need to worry. Bull sharks, um, you know, so bull sharks, uh, they can tolerate fresh water, right? I mean, I used to be a marine fisheries biologist, and they have been found, like, you know, as far north as, like, uh, Al Alton, Illinois, I think, up the Mississippi, but they're not in Lake Michigan. I mean, uh, you know, there's no way for them, so I don't really need to worry about that. So I, wouldn't, I wouldn't be too stressed, to tell you the truth. Okay, so... Yeah. Can I see that newspaper? Yeah, sure. Um, because you were talking about the the kind of... There you go. Yeah, thanks. So, yeah, flipping through this, I mean, I just wanted to... I wanted to take a look at your story. There's some weirdo stuff I, happening. Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, it is kind of the spooky season, they say, but I think it's probably just, you know, we're probably getting a little dehydrated. I guess we could drink oh, some yeah. lake water. Thank God we're not in Lake Erie. And, um, uh, yeah, maybe that'll help. No! Uh, oh, gosh, somebody's in trouble. <laughs> yeah, I thought yeah. I heard that, too. Did you hear that? Yeah. What the earth is going on? It sounded pretty close, too. It did. It did. I agree. Yeah. <laughs> oh, hey. So this is kind of an interesting story that's on the back side of the story that that Stuart shared. Um, it, it's like a you know they they reposted from a past version of Boo News, uh, Great Lakes Boos, and so it's dated February seventeenth, nineteen twenty eight, in the city of Dearborn, Michigan. Um, the headline is Authorities Report Local Man Missing, Family Claims Kidnapping. So here, I'll just, you know, read it. Maybe it'll chill us out um, as we're doing stuff here. So local man Walter Hutchinson was reported missing by his mother late last week. Hutchinson, who was a star pupil and athlete at Deborn Union School until his graduation three years ago, had moved to Chicago, Illinois to work as an idea man at a local manufacturing company. In recent years, he was known to send elaborate care packages to his mother, Ethel Hutchinson, and his three younger sisters, Lawrence, Lynn, and Rose. Ethel reported that Walter last visited the region for Valentine's Day, when he stressed that he was not sure when he would see her again, and seemed uncharacteristically agitated. Authorities say that foul play is not suspected, while Ethel maintains that her son was kidnapped by brutal gangsters. Walter was indeed the brightest, strongest person in his graduating class. Popular and confident, he eagerly embarked on his adventure west to Chicago, a place where he could finally let his ideas shine. While he missed his ma and younger sisters, the bustle and bright of the big city entranced him. Every day, he arrived at the factory early and remained late, putting forth ideas left and right and basking in the success of a job well done. Over time, though, his talents attracted the attention of a different kind of businessman. When they learned that he was originally from Dearborn and had grown up visiting the Detroit River shoreline, they began to recruit in earnest. First with praise and flattery, later with threats and coercion, Walter was made to cross the river time and again, taking the whiskey from Canada to the U.S. without drawing the eye of the feds. He was still talented, bright, and strong, and the money and riches he was given were nearly all sent back to Dearborn, to Ma, Flo, Lily, and Rose. On the night of February 14, 1928, he was partway along his usual run when the ice cracked and swallowed his vehicle whole. 
As he and the shipment sank together, he frantically tried to open the window, the roof, anything. But the pressure of the water was too great, and he realized there would be no escape. The ghosts of cannons, guns, people, and pets greeted him as the vehicle settled into the icy depths. He only hoped that his years of loyal service meant they wouldn't hurt Ma, Lo, Lily, and Rose. If you visit the bot, like this is a weird article too. So apparently this great like booze has been weird for a while because the very bottom says, if you visit the bottoms of the Detroit River and Lake St. Clair today, you will find all sorts of well-preserved treasures that tell the stories of humans, the water, and danger. Oh my. My goodness. That is uh, a a little bit uh, bit weird. Especially because we're in a slightly sinking boat right now. Yeah, that's the thing. Ethan, have you heard from Sito? I I haven't, but we might be in more than a slightly sinking boat. I'm oh. seeing some more holes in the well, bottom. That's fine. So, so, I mean, we got the life jackets. We obviously kept those. So I'm, I'm going to go ahead. I probably should have done this initially. I can put on my PFD, make sure it's a type, um, whatever the right type is. And I'll put that on. But uh, yeah. yeah, we did I, try I to think, tell you to put it on. Yeah, I think everything should be fine. Do you, do you hear what I'm hearing? Uh, what is that? What's that fin cutting in the water? Oh come on! Oh no! Come on! Oh, no! no. Ah! Oh, Geneva! Oh no! Oh, oh look out, Ethan! Oh my God! Oh, 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 Teach Me About the Great Lakes is produced by No Hope Charters, Scarolyn Foley, Megan Loaded Gun, and Ice Cream Miles. Ethan Boogeyman Chitty is our associate producer and fixer. Our super fun podcast artwork is by Joel the Zombie Davenport. The show is edited by the awesome Quinn Rose on your grave, and I encourage you to check out our work at aspiringrobot.com. If you have a question or comment on the show, Give us an email, teach me about the great lakes at gmail.com or leave a message on our hotline at 765 496 IISG. You can also follow the show on Twitter at Teach Great Lakes. Hey, everybody, have a wonderful, wonderful Halloween, and thank you for listening. And of course, keep grading those lakes. <laughs> Eaten by a shark in the Great Lakes. What a way to go.